Good morning, and welcome to Asbury's online service. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Thank you to those who have already completed the Readiness 360 survey. Our church is seeking to discover our people's opinions and experiences in a variety of areas so that we can determine our readiness as a group to step out into significant new mission endeavors. We want to include you. If you haven't completed the sur survey yet, you still have seven days. Please take a few minutes now to go to the link below or go to this link and take the survey using our code. It's readiness360.org and you can use our survey code 027-424-332. Please, take, please answer these questions candidly. The survey is anonymous. If you don't have a computer or internet access at home, please plan to stay for a few minutes following worship on Sunday. We have computer, computers available that will help you access the survey. If you know someone who is unable to access the survey online and is also unavailable to come to the church, please leave their name with me at the church office. Someone from the leadership board will contact that person and help them to complete the survey. Also, next Sunday is Father's Day, so honor your father or other male figure in your life by making a donation to the Tools of Hope program. This program of Church World Services provides hope for people and places that have been impacted by natural disasters, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and floods. Often places of safety and impact for, the, for these people are damaged or destroyed by these disasters. Your donation can help CWS provide needed resources for repairs and renewal. Father's Day, June 20th, is a great opportunity for us to honor the men in our lives to help others. Thanks and have a great week.
Good morning and welcome to the online worship for Asbury United Methodist Church. We're in our third week on our series on joy, looking at the letter to the Philippians from Paul. And last week we talked about maintaining our joy in the midst of conflict. But as Christians, we're not all about just maintaining the, the negative in our life. We, we need to strive for something. We need to move towards something. So that's what we're talking about this week, pressing on towards the goal. All right, we're going to go to children's time and the scripture, and I'll be right back with the message. Good morning, and welcome to Asbury's children's time. This week, we're talking about Philippians chapter 3. Have you ever tried to learn something new and found it to be really difficult? How about when you were quite young and you were first learning how to tie your shoes? That's a very difficult task for tiny hands. And I can imagine that you had to try over and over and over again to get a bow that wouldn't slip. Can you share some of your experiences when you tried to learn to do something new? Did you become discouraged or frustrated? In the Bible, the Apostle Paul talks about learning how to become a good Christian. He found it difficult and said he was not perfect, but he pressed on. He gives advice and says, to forget the things which are behind and stretch forward to the things which are before. To learn something new, we need to learn from our mistakes, then leave them behind and keep trying to improve and move ahead. Whether it's learning to tie your shoes, learning to knit, learning how to spell new words, learning how to be kind, learning how to throw a ball, or learning how to jump rope. Be positive and keep pushing forward towards your goal. Not one of us is perfect. We're all trying to be the people God intends us to be. The Bible reminds us that this is a high calling. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for bringing us together today. Give us the strength and the courage to keep moving forward and pressing on towards the things that we know you want us to do, to be good Christians, to be good people, to be good sons and daughters, and to never give up when things get difficult. In your name we pray, amen. Have a great week, everybody. Good morning, thanks for joining us. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Today, I'll be reading from Paul and Timothy's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 8 and 10 through 14. Yes, I will go further. Because of the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, I count everything else as loss. For him I accepted the loss of all other things, and look on them all as filth, if only I can gain Christ that I may come to know him and the power of, the, of his resurrection and partake of his sufferings by being molded to the pattern of his death, striving towards the goal of resurrection from the dead. Not that I have secured it already, nor yet reached my goal, but I am still pursuing it in the attempt to take hold of the prize for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not reckon myself as having taken hold of it. I can only say that forgetting all that lies behind me, and straining forward to what lies in front. I am racing towards the finishing point to win the prize of God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. 
You see, we find acceptance by God, not by the things that we do, not by the things that we've done, but by the will of Christ. Now, Paul knew this, the, the, the writer of the letter to the Philippians, he knew this, because Paul was a Jew among Jews. I mean, he was a Pharisee. He excelled beyond his peers. He, if there was a way to earn God's grace by doing works of the law, Paul had it. He was confident that he was uh, right with God. He was confident that, that all was good. He even bragged that he persecuted Christians because he thought that they were outside of the will of God and he was doing God's will. But then Paul had an encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. But that, that's a story for another time. After Paul's conversion and after his time away, kind of processing what had happened to him, he was an amazing church planter. He was going all across uh, southern Europe and planting churches, church after church. And he would go and plant and he would move on and he would care for these people and he would love these people. But he also had to deal with these people. See, there's, there's two sort of schools of thought that he had to deal with after he had planted a church. There was the, the legalists and the libertines. The legalists, they were the people that um, would come in after Paul would tell people about the, the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He would, he would uh, give them this message of hope and he would convert a bunch of people and they would start a church and then the legalists would come in and say, all right, now that you... Uh, have heard this good news, you, now you need to really please God and you need to follow the 613 commandments. And not only one of those is that you, you have to be circumcised. And now can you imagine, can you imagine uh, hearing this news and hearing about God's unconditional love and hearing about this freedom that you have in Christ and now you have to go through this quasi-medical procedure and uh, I don't think that would be a very popular message. And, and Paul was saying that you, not only that, you have to follow all these other laws. And, and, and they were working against what Paul was doing, so he was fighting against that. But on the other side, he was also fighting against the Libertines. The Libertines were these people who would, or almost the, the opposite extreme. They would, they would come in and they would hear Paul's message of, of freedom and love and grace and humility and all these good things. And then say, you know, since I'm forgiven, I'm just going to continue to, to do what I'm doing. I'm going to continue living the way I want to live. And I'm going to, I'm going to focus on my pleasure. I'm going to focus on myself and what I want. And I'm just going to tack Jesus' message on to the top of my, my life. Now, uh, this is not very different from today, is it? You know, we have people who are very legalist and we have people who are very uh, libertine. Uh, but Paul, Paul invites us to find a middle ground. And that's usually where the truth is found in the middle. Paul railed against the, the legalist because he lived that life. He knew that life. He was the best at it. Um, and he knew that that was not the path. And he, railed against the, the libertines because, because they were missing something. And the part that they were missing was the grateful response to God. God has done this great thing for us. God has given us this freedom. God has given us this new life. God has offered us this abundant life. And they were missing out. They were, they were missing out on the blessings of this new life. They were focused on their pleasure. They were focused on their own desires. And so their God was not the God of Jesus Christ. Their God was not the God that Paul was telling them about. Their God was their stomach. Their God was their desires. They put all their energy into those things rather than into the, the one true holy God that, that Jesus came to reveal, that Jesus enfleshed. Paul wanted to be clear that that joy, the joy that, that Jesus offers, that Jesus promised, is found in the grateful response. Paul writes in uh, Romans chapter 12, the first verse, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. In the scripture uh, lesson for today, the third chapter of the letter to the Philippians, Paul begins this way. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those who mutilate the flesh. Now he's talking about the legalists who want to uh, uh, require circumcision. But then in verses 18 and 19, Paul addresses the other side as well. You know, he, he, he's, he's called, <laughs> called the legalist dogs, and now he's going to talk about those libertines, those folks that who uh, their stomach is their God in verses uh, 18 and 19 of the third chapter. There, Paul says, For as I have told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Then, a little bit later, Paul, he begins to reflect on his own spiritual journey. In uh, verse 7, he writes, But now, whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. So the, when he was a legalist, when all those things that he did, the, the following the requirements, seeking God's approval by, by his own actions, he now calls that a loss for Christ. He understands now that that, that was not a benefit to him. He considers, or he continues, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. God already loves you. There's nothing more you need to do. You are already enough. And that is good news. To prove this, Jesus hung around some really broken people to show them that he loved them just as they were. He loved them and wanted to see the best for them. Jesus accepted people as they were. Now there's two key things that I want you to take away from today's message. And the first is, I've already said it, the first one is this, that God already loves you, that, that there's nothing more that you need to do to add on to what God has already done. You are loved and accepted just as you are. And the second thing is what I alluded to earlier. You need to find God's purpose for your life. Now your purpose probably isn't the same as my purpose. And it's not the same as the purpose that, of the person that you talked to last. You see, we are all each uniquely and wonderfully made. We all have our own purpose in God. And to, to seek that and to find that and to live that, that is the meaning of our lives. In verse 14 of the third chapter, Paul writes, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This human experience that we're experiencing, this, this spiritual, wonderful human experience that we've been given is God's gift to us. Now what we do with it, what we take and, and make out of it is our gift back to God. Now you, you are just as God intended. God did not make a mistake when, when God made you. Our purpose is to live into that uniqueness. Our purpose is to accept what God has given us just as we are and use that to honor and glorify God with every breath that we have. So what is your purpose in life? You should try to answer that because people with a purpose in their life, people with, with a focus and a direction, they live longer and happier and healthier lives. They have access to the joy that Jesus Christ has promised us. So who are you? 
be that person that God has created you to be. And who that is, I can't answer. Your, your, your people around you can't answer. Only you can answer that. Because only you know what God has given you. Only you know what, what, what is lurking deep inside of you at the very core of who you are. That's where you need to live. That's who you need to be. And if you're not clear about that, if you're not sure what I'm even talking about, it's never too late to seek God's purpose for your life. Okay, would you pray with me? Gracious God, we, we seek the joy that you offer. And it's not in some external place. It's not in some set of rules. It's in what you've already given us because you have already made us enough. Lord God, help us to, in Jesus' name, find our joy, find what it is that that we are supposed to do with this limited time we have on this earth. And Lord God, we will give you thanks. We'll respond in gratitude and we'll give you praise. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ has risen while the slumbers. Christ has risen where hope died. As he said and as he promised, as we doubted and denied, let the moon embrace the blessing, let the sun sustain the cheer, let the world confirm the rumor, Christ is risen, God is here. Christ has risen for the people whom he died to love and save. Christ has risen for the women bringing flowers to grace his grave. Christ has risen for disciples out of in an upstairs room. He whose word inspired creation can be silenced by the tomb. Christ has risen to companion former friends who fear the night, sensing loss and limitation where their faith had once burned bright. They behold what is no longer, they expect no hopeful sign, till Christ ends their conversation, breaking bread and sharing. Christ has risen and forever lives to challenge and to change. All those lives are messed or mangled, all who find religion strange. Christ is risen, Christ is present, making us what he has been. And evidence of transformation in which God is known. All right, friends, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have one more week, one more message in the series next week, and then we'll wrap it up, and then we'll be on to something new. All right, friends, go in peace, and may the God of peace be with you all. Amen.